Uh, welcome to Show Studios <laughs> Fully Digital Live Panel Discussions in collaboration with Harrods. For spring summer 2021, experts from all parts of the industry discuss and debate the most important shows of the season. Today, during London Fashion Week, we're going to be discussing Givenchy. Um, and I just want to uh, introduce anybody, everybody else is on the uh, panel. So we have uh, Georgia Moot, and would you like to uh, say something about yourself and introduce yourself? Oh, hi, thank you for having me back. My name is Georgia Moot. I'm a model and a presenter. Uh, and then we have Shanu uh, Walpitter. Hi everyone, um, I'm Shanu. I'm a trend director and also a lecturer at uh, LCF. I lecture in innovation and uh, fashion communications. And last we have Michael Hope. Hi, um, thank you for having me again. I'm a consultant for design and marketing strategy. I'm currently based out of New York and I'm so excited to do this today. <laughs> um, I suppose uh, I just want to kind of lead off with a question. Um, what does everybody think about changing a designer and launching a new designer during COVID? What are the good and the bad, the pros and the cons of this? Because obviously, um, I would have thought there's going to be more examination of the collections and what's going on now more than ever because everybody is at home um, and everybody has time on their hands to kind of really discuss and sort of think about what they're seeing. Um, Georgia, do you want to start? Sure. I mean, I think, like you said, one of the pros is definitely having a bit more attention on the change. You kind of know that everyone's going to be online and then that whilst that's quite a lot of pressure it also means you know it's quite good for the brand because it's gonna a lot of people are going to be talking about it and you know it's going to be written about and like people are going to kind of be waiting with their eager eyes but yeah definitely one of the cons I can only imagine is then the pressure there's always a pressure when you're a new designer at a house um so I guess it's probably you know and then being a new designer and then obviously you kind of know the success through sales. Do you think the sales with obviously what's happening and people having access, I mean, obviously people can buy online, but do you think that will be something that might impact it as well? I mean, I don't know because, <laughs> sorry, that was really, <laughs> I don't know. No, I don't, I don't know that it will, you know? I think, oh, it's so hard to say though, because, you know. But do you think as a luxury brand that doesn't, it, this is not going to make a difference? for the people who are going to buy it and have the money to buy it as well. Because I mean, I, I mean I'm mean, i assuming everything's going to come with it. It's going to be at least four figures. Or anything. Well, yeah. yeah, but I mean, isn't that the same said for every designer in COVID at the moment? You know, I don't know if there's anything new with having switched the designer. I think it would have been a similar price point previously anyway. So I think that's just for the whole luxury market anyway um so i don't think it's anything specific necessarily about givenchy this season that's going to kind of put people off buying it um due to the pandemic i think that's just a hit that the whole industry has had to take and i also think then it kind of shifts the focus almost into more caring more about the aesthetic and the actual collection because to part with your money you're going to have to really love it and really be invested in it at this time um, well, one of the things, of, of course, about, you know, going to a shop and sort of seeing an object is that you fall in love with the object. So, so now, obviously, you know, as you're sort of saying, everything will be online. So is it about people falling in love with the idea of the brand and the story behind it more as well going to be more important? I think so. I think it's people being sold on the collection. I think it's people like really falling in love with this new kind of direction. And that will decide whether people, yeah, want to kind of justify spending that price point. Um, so if anything, I think it's quite exciting. I mean, it's always a risk to switch designers out anyway, especially during a pandemic, but I think it's one that might pay off just from having seen the initial reaction to the collection. I mean, it's literally been what, like 24 hours and I've seen it everywhere. I've seen the three pronged sandal. I've seen the, the I've seen everything. Um, so I think it's, I think it's going to be quite good. Also, they didn't do a show, you know? So, I mean, it's probably, I mean, I don't, I'm not trying to talk about numbers because that's definitely not my speciality, but like, you know, in some ways it's almost easier to get the same amount of uh, excitement brewing online as it is if you were then to do a show and spend all that money on that side of things. So, yeah. Uh, Shanu, how about you? What's, what's your reaction to things like that as well? Um, 
I think being online certainly democratizes the experience for lots of other people. So, you know, obviously there is this elitism with having a show, but it, it being online opens it up to lots more discussions. And with a new designer coming in, I agree completely that, you know, it's tricky, but it's also amazing because it can kind of put a spotlight on a collection that might not maybe get the same amount of visibility otherwise. Um, and with this collection in particular, I think there's so many amazing commercial pieces that are gonna do really well, especially with the accessories, the bags and the footwear and the tailoring as well. So I think there's definitely um, a lot of positivity to come out of it as well. And Michael, what's your reaction? I definitely agree with what Georgia and Shanu said. I think, uh, you know, now is probably the perfect time to switch creative directors because the whole industry has had no choice but to foot put full brakes on the gas. So like, I think taking almost, trying to be in touch with the whole Instagram generation per se, uh, it's clear that Claire Wright Keller's stuff did not do very well commercially. So I think they're trying to bring back that sort of energy that you had under Tishi, especially thinking 2013, like when that stuff really, Instagram was first taking off on a global level with streetwear, with the culture. And uh, I think it's definitely connecting back to that. I think they definitely, as Shanu said, it's more democratized releasing it online. So I think that's perfect because very much, I think they're trying to, versus Claire's collections, they're trying to shift it to younger demographics and definitely also push in the, in China, Korea, areas that have a lot more young people that are really trying to buy high-end designer goods. So I think it's maybe no one can say COVID is the perfect timing, but probably the perfect timing in terms of this transition. Um, and do you think as well, just, I mean, because everything you know, is going to be online. So is it going to be about more celebrity endorsements? Is it going to be like films? What do you think is going to be the thing? I mean, there's a lot of hype that we've all sort of mentioned as well, and I'm sure there will continue to be over the next week about it as well. So what do you think will be the thing that really sells and has those people going out and buying online without, for me, and when I go and buy, I need to see an object, I fall in love with an object. You know, I'm not everybody, but you know, it's what do you think will be the thing that will just trigger that, that people actually do go and spend the money? Yeah, I don't know. I think that I'd like to see which direction Matthew takes it in because I think the most unique thing someone could do, and this will probably pay off commercially over time, is to almost reject the whole celebrity endorsement Instagram thing. But I'm not sure how likely that is given what I've seen from Aleeks. And, uh, you know, I, I don't know. Maybe I'm more optimistic because actually at the beginning of this week, I got pretty sick. And I deleted Instagram off my phone and this whole week versus being probably addicted to Instagram before I've been totally off Instagram. And uh, honestly, it's let me when I've looked at these collections, probably enjoy them more because I don't I don't want to see a bunch of people just posting the same thing. So I think when people see something and see it more as something personal and sentimental, it might have more value. And I think young people are increasingly moving in that direction. So. And I mean, obviously, that's the theme of um, the, the collection as well. The love locks as well are all in there as well. And this idea of something as precious as love being locked away as well. So, I mean, maybe that is one of the things, the emotional factor added into there as well. Um, what parts of the collection did you all like? Um, Georgia, let's start with you again. I loved the accessories. I thought they were so special with the chain as well, like the attention to detail on whether it was the chain, like the, the buckle on the strap of the shoe that matched, you know, kind of ran through the collection. I love the, um, yeah, just the kind of hardware of the accessories. I thought it was amazing. Um, what I was also gonna say back to Michael's point just then was, I think everyone kind of has battled with this, you know, during lockdown and COVID, this, their relationship with social media and being online. So it's very interesting now to see that fashion week is happening, how that is also the relationship is changing um, and how people are kind of moving through that sphere on social media. But I do think that Matthew Williams already had quite a following. Um, and I think it's probably worked quite well in his favor that now everything is online because I do think a lot of the kind of younger generation 
or you know were already kind of enjoying his stuff via social media and now it's just kind of transferred to another house i think it's quite beneficial and then uh shanu what do you think uh, what's your favorite bits of the collection um, I echo the sentiment of Georgia. I love the accessories, but I also really love the tailoring and the, I don't know, I think there was a really interesting thing happening with um, like how the collection built. So it started off quite sober with black and white, black and off whites, then more textures started coming in, which I loved all the detailing and then more print. And then it kind of ended again with quite a more subdued but textural kind of finish. And I, I just love all of the all of that together. And I think the detail is where I was kind of most drawn towards, like all the kind of cutouts or the like tailored um, sophistication and the, the sculpturalness of like the jackets and and even the dresses. I just thought there was a lot to look at, and I, I love that with anything with fashion. Like for me, it's all the, all about details always. So yeah, I think for me it was the whole thing in some ways. Um, yeah, the, the cohesion between all of the kind of details I think was really really interesting. Yeah, there was a lot of sexy details. Very sexy. <laughs> All of it as well, and very kind of slick um, as well. And yeah, as you said, just kind of building those layers of sexiness and slickness and transparency as well. Michael, what did you love about the collection? I would say my favorite two looks were looks two and six, solely on the basis of the jackets and those two suits. I think that Matt, uh, he took the tailoring from Elite's which previously has become more and more developed, but maybe sometimes a bit over-designed. And this is a more refined, and let's say, honestly, more of a finished product of the tailoring we've seen at Alix. To me, this is the end destination, and it's doing something that's both modern without seeming too overtly futuristic. Like, so it was the, the white blazer and the black blazer. Those two were just really really well done because I think they have a timelessness to them, but are still very contemporary. Yeah. And uh, yeah, that was good to see. So if I was Givenchy, I would be happy that that is within their control. And, you know, almost all of this tailoring from Malik's has winded into that, you know, the jackets and the tailored coats from the men's collections of the last year. So, well, and, and obviously that's the access to those houses and all those amazing technicians that he would have been able to work with before. So, that, you know, it's the realization of things that might never have been able to happen before, but you're in a couture house and now you have access to all these master tailors, people who know all these wonderful techniques to make your dreams come true, which is great for him as well to develop the brand and the look. The tailoring was definitely stepped up a level like that was noticeable when you were scrolling through the collection it was like perfection it was amazing so wearable and so commercial and like all the little details with also the hardware coming through i just loved all of it yeah the one i don't know what look it is sorry i don't have the number to hand but the black suit jacket that had the little silver drop like buckle detail i don't know oh yes that's the one <laughs> <laughs> yeah that one <laughs> Yeah. Um, and then, Michael, I know that there were sort of features on there that you were kind of referencing and thinking about other designers who'd sort of come before and used these. these yeah, well. definitely. It's funny you have that look up right now. The closure right there, you know, Prada Fall 2019, very recently, their women, they had black women's tailored coats with a pretty similar hook closure, a little bit asymmetric. And I feel this very much was a more simplified take on that at least from what I saw. But uh, just back to your last question with my favorite stuff, honestly, my favorite thing in the entire collection was this three-toe kind of styling gimmick they did with the socks. And uh, that reminded me a lot of the gloves Carol Christian Powell did with these kind of deformed fingers that were almost paw-like, but in a, in a grotesque way. And uh, I think he, with the brown, there was one look, one look in the Leaks collection that was the purple, purple long pant with that horn sandal with the brown sock. And uh, that to me was the best example. Let's see if we can find that. It's a purple long tailored trouser. 
there. Yeah, if we zoom in here on the bottom. Come on, technology, work with us. <laughs> Sorry, you can't zoom in on the Show Studio website. <laughs> so what they, the socks to me, it was like Scooby-Doo Brown. It was really like Scooby-Doo's paws, but uh, in a way that was not too comical, you know, such as something like Jeremy Scott. It was much more elegant and... Uh, the animal heel, I wasn't in love with it. I get that he's going back to McQueen with, I think it was the Fall 97 McQueen collection and also some work McQueen did at Givenchy. Uh, but the the heels in most of the looks kind of bordered on this like 2010s Giuseppe Zanotti. Not really my thing. I'm not sure if I was ready for that to come back. But in this look, with the long pant, covering most of the shoe and you just have this paw peeking out in the front and then the end of the horn kind of coming up in the back. That was so cool. And I think any criticism I had was eliminated because this came out so perfectly. And like the red color, this coral color of the sandal, then with this like muted light brown of the paw toe coming through and then the heel being like a slightly different shade of purple from the pant. It was really well done color blocking. I think color blocking can be really tough for a lot of designers, but just that little part at the bottom, such a small thing. Like I love little peeking out details. So I really like that one part in this look. It just stood out to me so much. Any other details for anybody else that they loved? I have to say that the in that same image, actually, the kind of knotting as well was a really nice effect. I thought it added some softness in contrast to some of the more tailored um, shapes we were seeing. So I really enjoyed that as well. Like there was this really nice um, shift between like structure and then also the in the shears, it was quite light and feminine and like, but still really stark in some way. And I really enjoyed all of those kind of subversions together, I think. Yeah, and I think the other thing that was really nice is there was a nice working of different silhouettes coming through. So that lengthened silhouette kind of started and kind of went all the way through the uh, through the collection. I love the way that the handbag turned into the shoulders. You know, there were some nice things that kind of went through all the way through there as well. And there's, um, yeah, I was really curious. It'd be nice to know who the um, uh, stylist was for this, but we're guessing that it's going to be Lotta who would have done the styling for this as well. But it's also, for me, it feels very... As you were saying, Michael, sort of like 210. Um, I worked a lot with Patty Wilson. It feels very much like Patty Wilson. It feels very much like what how Patty would kind of style things for her shoots mm. as well. So um, I could see that there was a lot in there already to appeal to a lot of people as well. Yeah, I think it's kind of coming back to the era where Matt and Virgil and Heron all kind of came onto the scene at first. I'm thinking 2013. I was a kid. I was watching it all happen in New York. And uh, I was lucky enough to meet them. And uh, it's funny because I feel like a lot of the vibes I got in this collection, I don't know if it was intentional or not, but it really was all like, I saw many things that were very distinctively 2013, which is like when they all kind of made their transition into the real high fashion world and this changing of the guard kind of begun to happen. So for better or for worse, I think that if that was an intentional, yeah, those hats as well. Like, you know, it seemed like a novelty. You'd see Will I Am or some unmemorable K-pop star wearing back then. But uh, I know the horns are a nod to McQueen. But is doing a new era cap like this in leather like a nod to Tishi as well? I think uh, very, very clear of that early 2010s era. So uh, if people are ready for that, I think it's the perfect time to revive it. Well, I mean, the thing is that we need, all need a place to go and wear it, don't we, really? For me, it feels like, you know, most of the stuff has originated somewhere along the line and or been seen in a nightclub somewhere. It's like, where are we going to see it now? Is it just going to be slowly online and in, on Instagram as well? Where, yeah, where will people wear this, I suppose? Where is it going to go? Is it just going to be for something at home or, and people just put it online? Um, because I mean, lockdown is going to last for a while longer. Um, so, so where where do you think? Or is it you know? Because I mean, we're allowed to gather for weddings and funerals and things like that. So, where is this clothes destined for as well? 
Are you trying to imply that we're going to wear a, a Givenchy suit to a funeral? <laughs> I know, well, I'm just, I'm just asking the question. Right? Because, I mean, because the stuff is ritzy, it's sexy, it's, you know, it's luxurious. So, I mean, where is it, where is it going to be kind of worn? And what's going to be worn? I mean, what's going to be bought for? Because, you know, whether we like it or not, most of us buy things for an occasion or you know i'm going here i'm going there i'm going to this amazing party I, I need to look amazing maybe people will buy it more out of hope now like a kind of for in a few months time or a sort of wishing everything everything's so uncertain so i feel like yeah i'd probably wear i mean who knows i'd wear it to tesco's do you know what i mean if i could afford it um i can't but it's it's interesting michael what, that you brought up virgil because I was thinking as I was looking through the whole collection, my my one, it, it's not even a criticism because I genuinely don't really have a lot of criticism for this collection. I loved it. But I did definitely notice a lot of kind of heavy referencing or whether direct or indirect, I was kind of scrolling through it and I was a bit like, okay, I'm getting Helmut Lang. I'm getting Prada. I'm getting, and it's funny because obviously, you know, Virgil has been accused quite a few times of also heavily referencing. And I think a lot of streetwear designers have, um, or, you know, kind of I, I wouldn't I wouldn't call them streetwear but uh no I, no neither would I um, recently but uh anyways like you know my nod to Virgil was more just saying that was Matt's like OG crew but uh now that you bring that parallel that that's funny to think about but more so I think their approach is definitely very different uh Oh yeah, a thousand percent. I just mean it's interesting how they all started in the same, like you said, the OG crew, and they have been heavily accused of heavily referencing Virgil House previously. Yeah. Um, but it is. I did see a lot of references to other collections within this collection, which I love because it's quite timeless. I think it can obviously it's like transient. None of no idea is like a completely original idea, especially when it comes oh, to tailoring. But, and like we said, with the accessories and everything, I think it's totally made its own thing. But I did definitely look through it and go like, okay, yeah, I can see a little bit of this and a bit of that. Or even like in Helmut Lang's, I think it was 2018, where it was Shane Oliver from Hood by Air. There were a lot of similarities with the leather, um, like bag situation. I saw quite a few similarities. It's funny, I've looked at that Shane collection over a, uh the last few months like once again and that's also something that at the time I wasn't sure how I felt but it's definitely grown on me a lot uh for better or for worse but I think that sorry just give me a sec you know with this collection and what were you saying before like where are you gonna wear stuff I think even before COVID fashion the direction of fashion has be unfortunately been becoming more and more a costume for Instagram simply put and uh i think that alienates some people but also brings in a lot of new people because we live in an era of constant seeking for validation seeking for pleasure and uh the way fashion works now is very suited for that i think uh purchasing something in a hopeful nature is very much that pursuit of instant gratification of pleasure it's like okay i need this now I don't know what the future is going to be like, but at least I have this thing to make me optimistic. Much, You can talk about the love lock. It's commodifying something sentimental and turning it into consumer good. And I think that very much now in the age of uh, when we're more connected, but more alienated than ever, those are the sorts of things that we see more and more. I mean, you have, you have uh, influencers or cam girls, depending on how what people call them, selling bath water to people, use bath water. So I think in this day and age, we have such a focus on selling emotions above everything else. I totally agree. I think that's definitely what's happening right now, but also in the future. So I think like definitely a, a kind of return to um, that hopefulness you were talking about, but also conscious behaviors as well and how we shop. So making, you know, decisions based on our feelings or our kind of values 
And mm -hmm. that, that can also relate to luxury fashion as well, because you're making a conscious decision to buy into a brand that you either, that you're going to love in some way, because it's a lot of money. <laughs> let's be, let's be fair. So you're going to invest in a piece that you want to keep for a long time, that you want to wear when you can one day in the future. So I think it very much is an emotional thing that's becoming much, much more of a drive in consumer behavior. And I think also in the, um, just talking about the longevity of the collection and people buying things now, but you know maybe wearing them in two years, there's definitely reference in the um, uh, press release about these being kind of tasters of what's to come. So, you know, maybe, you know, the, the G chain will kind of last for another three or four collections and, you know, but you had it first. So I think there is all of that. So hopefully it will, you know, the currency of it being fashion will hopefully last and that you kind of, or into that by buying it now as well. Um, is there anything else? I mean, I loved all the like the ribbon dresses. I love the transparencies. Um, I mean, obviously th there is the leather, but there's obviously, you know, detailed um, work with um, uh, embroidery and things like that going on with beading. Was there any other details uh, that you guys loved in there as well? There was, I think there was a lot, but I think because it was so slick as well, simply presented, I think maybe some of it gets lost as well. Um, so was there anything else that you really loved about it with those sorts of smaller um, uh, details as well? I mean, obviously the bags, I love that the bags, were, um, the locks were made and everything from metal to, I think in the press release it's sort of saying that there was stuff made in um, perspex and plastic as well. So they kind of went for all sorts of amazing de detail. And then also just thinking about all that production that kind of goes on for all of those sorts of things as well. There's like a lot of like new things that they've kind of made for the collection um, and just thinking about the longevity for all of those. I mean, I was just thinking as well, looking at it now, there is, there's no masks, there's nothing particularly sustainable or jumping out as being sustainable in here, which is obviously something we've been talking about for the past you know, year or so, I think, as well in fashion. So was there anything else that you wanted to kind of pick up on through this? I mean, I don't think there's necessarily anything sustainable as in kind of like at the forefront, especially in like a marketing sense. But I do think by the fact that, like we were saying, it's quite a timeless collection and that these are pieces that you can imagine having in your wardrobe for however many years in itself is a slightly more sustainable nod to fashion, because at least it's not something that is just going to be able to be worn for this one season. And then, you know, you're kind of, on to the next which I also think was a discussion that kind of went on surrounding consumerism within lockdown and surrounding the whole fashion industry and the way that the industry kind of creates and creates a need for kind of consumption um so yeah I don't think it was like sustainability at the forefront but I'd almost rather the approach be a genuine one of like here's a beautiful tailored piece that you will keep in your wardrobe and you will wear and won't just go to waste um, than it just be some kind of flimsy marketing, you know, what's that called when it's like greenwashing? Greenwashing, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's also speaking to Matthew's kind of ethos with Alix. You know, it's all about like longevity, things that you keep for a long time, things that are well made. And I think that definitely echoes in this um, collection as well. So it's things that you would definitely want to keep hold of for a long time, hopefully, I hope. <laughs> indeed i think that uh with fashion so often sustainable fabrics and production is important but the most important thing overall is producing things that are have a long-term lifespan not only the lifespan of purchase you in this collection i can see things being seasonless being carried over in stores for a long period of time not being put on sale i think that's a very important strategy because but how do you do that while making people remain engaged, while making it not seem saturated, not seem tired? Because when you see something on Instagram so much, you don't even want it anymore. You've seen it a million times. So I think that's kind of like two things that are in opposition of each other, but so often are shown together. I think a lot of brands are going to learn over time that there's more decisions that have to be made on that basis. I think, uh, but I really like the the idea of themes, like not every season you need to make a brand new collection, you know, there's things that can be carried over because they're that timeless, they're that strong, like no one, 
every brand makes a collection every season and so much of the product will just forever sit in a warehouse and be passed around between third parties that will resell it at a further markdown price. Like better that the brand itself never puts the stuff on sale, but that they know over time there will be new customers who will who will want it. So I think that that way of sustainability of not trying to like fashion doesn't need to be a sensory overload. Fashion can be calm and peaceful in the sense that it's selling you something you're selling something that's always going to be in demand versus like trying to constantly invigorate people to want something that they don't need. I think we've also been conditioned for a very long time to want to con constantly want new things. And now we're seeing a backlash to that because I think we're understanding that there is a huge issue with that because it's, it's wasteful. It's putting pressure on, um, you know, on our planet and the way that we live. So we're looking for ways to counteract that with thoughtful value conscious based decisions in the way that we shop and the way that we also interact and look at brands are we, we you know like i'm making a judgment about a brand because not because of the kind of fast fashion or the kind of fast turnover but because they have like a really good ethical stance or they have like a really amazing story or they've got something that connects to me emotionally in some way going back to what we were saying earlier about emotion being this new kind of need this new necessity in the way that we consume um so yeah, I can definitely see that happening with this collection. You know, there's a lot of things that will keep me coming back to it for the right reasons. Um, and do you think that we would be having this conversation, just as we were all talking then, I was just thinking, would we be having this conversation about any other collection that we've seen? Or is this, I mean, is there something about this collection which is highly covetable by the looks of it already? Um, and then obviously are we sort of like, I mean, maybe this is part of the, the marketing, the, the, the adding the extra value to this as well by having these kind of conversations about brands like this and new designers and where they're kind of going as well. Um, because obviously by having this discussion alone, we've been thinking about it, we're adding some value somewhere to that brand as well. Um, and I've not really seen anything else through any of the fashion weeks where I'd be talking about this as well, because you know, most have made a sta stand about sustainability. Um, or there's been masks, or there's been references to uh, what's happening around us. Um, but this collection seemed, as we've said, timeless, out of time. It could be anywhere in the last sort of like five years to maybe five years in the future that it could be shown as well. So is that a, a really amazing, incredibly magical thing that's kind of happened with this collection? Um, and where Givenchy has sort of aimed its marketing business as well. I think there is something quite unique about this, the conversations we're having. Georgia, any thoughts? So it's like, uh, whatever, it's more fashion. <laughs> oh, no, no, I think it was more that I just really agreed with everything you were saying. So I was like, yes, yes, <laughs> did it on the head. No, I think you're right. I mean, I think it's completely the designer's choice as to whether they want to reference the times. But obviously, if you reference the times by using masks while relevant now, then you have to think, is it going to be relevant however long in the future? It's like we were saying, it's kind of towing that balance, you know, between like, being relevant, keeping people excited, keeping people wanting to come back for more and bring them new stuff versus like longevity, being timeless, having like beautiful tailored pieces that you're going to want to keep. It's that very kind of the fine line that I think a lot of designers have had to kind of toe this season and had to have kind of made a conscious decision as to whether they're going to address this time that we're in now because it's so big and it's kind of like, you know, very very relevant or whether they're gonna kind of not sidetrack like not bypass it but just kind of you know keep keep the thing moving but um yeah I, I mean I think there hasn't been this kind of discussion around it around a lot of other collections but you can see every designer has kind of made their own individual choice as to which side of that line they're gonna they're gonna take and uh a lot of people really haven't made much choice at all. Like uh, so many brands just are putting out collections just to keep the ball rolling. And it's like for so long, even before COVID, it was so clear that something was very wrong in the business model of collections, wholesale, the way everything was working. And like 
uh, now seeing brands that still like don't care to choose a side, don't care to like really say anything. It's like, are you artists or are you just like these brands might as well be like Primark or something because they're not they're not selling anything to inspire people or motivate people to think in a new way. Like I feel like the role of a designer should be to introduce things to market that people aren't ready for while also pushing people to think of clothes in new ways to be attracted to new things. So I think when brands don't do that and brands just go off what gets ordered on wholesale every season, they lose their edge. And over time, people just don't pay attention. And uh, in the time when we were all looking at this collection, because it was something, it was kind of a spectacle, there was so much else going on. Like a lot of brands did choose not to show collections, but so many of the ones that did, I mean, no one I know has even spoke about them because there's nothing notable. I mean, Rick, for example, had this show and he did masks, but it seemed like a gimmick, like, all the brands, I'm glad Matt didn't put masks in the Givenchy show because it's like people are just going to look back and be like, okay, this is so 2020, not in a way like this was anything memorable in the sense of it being something people want to care about. It's going to be like, okay, why do I have to see this again? We're so past 2020. Well, instead you know. of greenwashing, we've got COVID washing. <laughs> yeah, COVID washing. But I mean, how is selling masks for example, they've had all these masks, I mean, not fashion masks, but the whatever synthetic material the masks are made of piling up in the ocean, piling up everywhere. Like in New York City, I walk down the street and it's just less so these last few months, but like during lockdown in the neighborhood I live in, just dirty masks all over the street. It's like, I don't know which way is the right way. Do we want to not get sick or do we want to just piss on the earth? Like, But then would designers have also got in being criticized if they hadn't referenced this time because it's almost a bit you know you can't ignore that this has been a huge time and a talking point for everyone and I get what you mean about a lot of the time for a designer it's about inspiring people it's about like going to the looking to the future and it's it's about kind of innovating but also the when the future is so uncertain maybe it's also and the now is so kind of big it almost I think they would have been criticized if they hadn't of I'm just like I almost predicted that designers would be making masks you know because it's so relevant to now it's like you kind of I don't blame designers for referencing I think it's just like I was saying you kind of they maybe have to choose which one they want to go for whether they want to or not but I think if all of them hadn't, then we'd be a bit like, okay, are we just going to ignore what's been going on this whole time? Or are we just going to bypass 2020? As much as I'd love to, it's mm -hmm. not really reality. I think that uh, there's much more intelligent. I think it's so important to be current. I think although designers should look to the future and look to the past, like it's so important to be current. The collections that are always the most exciting to me are the ones that feel so currently relevant. Like, some of my favorite collections in the last few years, when they were shown, they felt so in touch with the present. However, I think there's much more intelligent ways to display being connected to the present than doing the most obvious visually signifying thing, such as someone doing masks in 2020. Like there's much more sly and artistic ap approaches that people could have to showing that. So I think like, Let's say, I mean, for example, Demna, like Demna in his work very much always seems so current without seeming too gimmicky and too much like he's trying to just say the most obvious thing, oh, masks in 2020, you know, so. I guess also all the digital adaptations are quite an homage to now, you know, the way that so many design houses have done such a great uh, job at kind of adapting to the online whether that be films whether that be cgi whether you know that i feel like that has kind of is quite a nice homage to this year and will kind of be forever memorable but like you said it's maybe less kind of obvious than mm -hmm. like sticking to the same model but just putting a mask on you know i think only time will tell which stuff maintains longevity in the future which stuff 
it signifies the present we're in as something memorable and historic versus just as a novelty. So we'll see down the road. But I think, I mean, what you said before, Michael, though, is, is um, people just putting a mask into a collection just because, it, you know, it's relevant. It's now rather than actually thinking significantly about what the mask means, what it means to people wearing it, the, uh, there's the intelligence behind putting a mask in a collection is maybe something that's been missing. So, you know, maybe somebody comes up with something that kind of addresses that in a more intellectual way as well. Um, but I mean, I mean, it's great that we're talking about this collection that has no masks. We're talking about intent. We're talking about sincerity. We're talking about all those sorts of things that having a mask would have also signified um, in some way as well. So, you know, they've done a good job here at Shibonshi. Damned if you do, damned if you don't, right? Yeah, yeah exactly. But I think, I think they've handled it incredibly well. And uh, yeah, yeah, I mean, it's not, a, it's not a question while you're looking at the collection, you're going, you know, is this sustainable? Where's the mask? What's going on? How, the, how can I relate to this? Because you can relate to it on so many levels. And I love all the referencing, of, you know, all the, all the designers in this as well, because it helps. It gives, there's that bright edge of nostalgia with modernity, with future and with hope. And, it's a very good collection. Yeah, I think it's fashion in the, in the best sense. Like I say this with no malice intended, but it's fashion fan fiction. It's like to the people that know about all these references, it speaks to them because it's like revisiting all of these things that matter to those people. Like all of the references in this collection, I noticed whether from Helmut Lang, whether from Margiela, whether from Prada, whether from even recent Demna at Balenciaga and Vetmont, like Tishi, Givenchy, McQueen, like every, all of the things I noticed, it's like, okay, I get it. He did his take on it. Like it speaks to me because these are the things that I relate to and the things that are familiar. So I think it's good when designers do that because first it speaks to the audience that purely consumes fashion as like a social signifier. And then it speaks to the like fashion nerds per se. And uh, they, they see the stuff and in this day and age, I think people are less mad about designers taking references because we're in the age of just everything being there on the internet. Like, it's very hard to not take references when you see everything. So I think uh, it's very good that, sorry, I just forgot my train of thought for a second. Crap. <laughs> But I think it's good to, to, to make it a homage to like so many people in the industry over the years as well. Oh. That's very clever that that's just been done. So it makes it, you know, there's a lot of other design houses and people who've worked with design houses, as you said, fashion nerds, who are going to feel that somehow they're included in this new collection and this new world that, that's going to be happening at Givenchy. So I think that's really important. Yeah, but Indeed. it's also not, oh, sorry. Oh yeah, I just wanted to say the thing I remembered, which was that in this age, designers are less designers, but they're more curators and they curate a mood and a, a world for people. It's a, a community in a way, a community that maybe you can't be part of, but you can appreciate and buy. So I think that's what they do. Shano, what were you about to oh, say? I, I think I was just gonna say that it definitely caters to the fashion nerds and those who want to have that intellectual link, but it also doesn't alienate others who just want to appreciate it for what it is and want to buy into it because they think it's pretty or beautiful or wearable. And I think that's kind of like a magic with any kind of collection that I love. It's kind of always straddling those two lines where it's like really, really intellectual on one hand, but also really wearable and successful because of that. So yeah, I think that was, a really good thing to see. Yeah, you've made a very universal collection. I think that's definitely one thing that is, you know, quite obvious throughout it. I just, I do sometimes think it's quite hard with referencing whether, I think it's like a, like anything, it's on a spectrum. And I think how different people look at it, they're going to take it a different way. I mean, I know, for example, the shoes, the three prong shoes, I've seen only really in conversation with, the Margiela tabby you know so it's that it's very kind of and it's it's a conversation starter and it's interesting and I do think that it's right to kind of push the line of referencing and you know whether it, I mean it's also subjective but I did that was my one kind of 
yeah, like I was saying earlier, it's not a criticism, but it was my one kind of thought where I was like, oh yeah, I'm definitely seeing a lot from kind of other people. And it's nice. It's like, it makes me happy. It, it, it's nice to see the references and to appreciate what it's been turned into, but it is definitely being talked about in conversation alongside a lot of other designers. You know, it's kind of constantly like, here's the shoe, here's the tabby, you know, it's like, it's, and it, it I feel like it maybe is, a kind of standalone it's worthy of a standalone collection you know I think just going forward I'd be excited to see maybe slightly just a tiny bit less referencing so that it's not discussed right next to you know another item that's kind of somewhat similar but I mean I think the thing that what happens with that when you uh reference something and then it gets picked up in, in, in the media and conversations um, with other designers it instantly rises your level of where you're up to and you're on the same level as Margiela, or you're on the same level as Chanel or whoever might have been referenced or Helmut Lang. So, you know, it, it's, it's quite an interesting tool to use in collections to get you sort of, for people to think of you as, on the same level as a designer of sincerity, of integrity, of all those sorts of things as well. You know, your design capability and knowledge as well. So I think it's a really interesting thing to kind of do. And I think as you sort of said, Georgia, as well, I'm sure that they'll go forward and do their own sort of thing, probably less referencing um, for now as well. Um, we're coming up to the end of our time in a sec. Is there anything else anybody wanted to talk about? Was there anything that anybody really liked? If there was one thing that you could get out of the collection, what would it be, Georgia? It'd be a tie between the dress, like I think it was like a yellow dress with the back and the open sleeve situ. It'd be a tie between that or one of the bags. If I was slightly shorter, I would take the three pronged heel, but I don't wear heels. So just on a practical level, no. They're my dreams, yes. <laughs> Shanu? Um, I think. This is completely slightly different, but I would love to see in the next collection a, more, a less homogenous take on the models. I know it sounds a bit yeah. cutting, but I thought they were all had the same body shape. And I would love to see someone with a different body shape wearing the same clothes, because I want I don't have that body shape and I'd love to see what it looks like on someone else. Uh, in terms of collection, what I'd like to see going forward, obviously tailoring because I love it and I think that's gonna be a big part of what comes next. And I know this is just the blueprint of what's still to come um but uh, yeah i just love like the kind of i guess the leaning into alix and some of the kind of practicalities and the futurism in some way but also like the sensualness and the sexiness i want to continue seeing that going forward as well and i mean i think what you sort of touched on there about the diversity of models as well i mean this this is a fashion collection for fashion lovers on fashion models do you know what i mean so that that's what this first thing is so i would have assumed that going forward there'll be some more um diverse body types as well i'd love to see some tailoring on a curve girl right exactly same like some really really sleek tailoring like just gorgeously fitted because i think so often we do see um tailoring on one body like shape so yeah, yeah. It, can, it looks so sexy and so amazing so sexy yeah <laughs> we'll fight for the curve definitely <laughs> um michael how about you yeah back to what shanu and uh georgia said you know from the male side i think actually a lot of i could say the same thing they did a lot of if we go to the two looks that had the leather briefs which were very classic helmet laying spring 2001 except matt did them bare on a very toothpick like male model and i'd like to see mott in terms of the casting for male models models that more provoke a sense of masculinity in a sense of men who have a more who don't have such a narrow body type i think there should be more maybe not muscular. I think but... this collection was also sort of like, um, uh, sort of uh, celebrating gender genderless um, uh, fashion as well. So I think they went for the easy option and just make everybody stick thin. Um, because you can be genderless and curvy as well, but they went for the, the fashion option. I think that being toothpick-like often does not invoke, it's very androgynous. It doesn't invoke sense of masculinity or femininity when people are looking for that. And I think that like in these looks, you had this one and then you had the 
I think it was a red brief as well. Both of the looks are kind of duplicates of the same look. To me, it felt like, you know, a child playing a perverse take on a child playing dress up in his father's closet with these like briefs and then this big ski jacket just thrown over it. It was a a bit odd. And I think that it could have been executed in a way that was more inspiring from a sense of it being still subversive, but keeping a more masculine character. I mean, what helmet did with leather briefs, like, if you're going to re- emulate him, I think you can do it in a way that's more in tune with his sensibilities. Like what Helmet did with the leather briefs, it was like tailored blazer open. I don't remember if there was a shirt or not, but tailored trouser and just the waistband peeking out because the trouser was slightly low rise. So you have just, you can tell in the slightest sense that they're wearing leather underwear, but it's not like in your face. And I think Helmet used models that were much more in tune with like real men. I think that Helmet had a very good approach to casting where he oh, casted. Oh, you have to be careful here about talking about real men and real um, uh, binary stereotypes. So just be oh, I don't mean it in that way. I'm saying real men in a sense that men on the street, like not just these toothpick like models. Yeah. I meant like in a sense of uh, real people, you know, the guys who want to buy the menswear from Helmet Lang. That's what I meant. And I think that what I saw very much was like with Helmet's casting and he's often so emulated. And I think people emulate this approach to casting very much, but I just, I, I was disappointed. I didn't see it in this collection because Helmet had people of all ages, you know, a very wide group of people who really felt like they weren't models, but they were people of strong character, people who had a story to tell. And I very much like that because it lets people feel like they can play a part in it instead of just seeing it on a mannequin, you know? Yes, and I think that's what we're talking about here, isn't it? It's mannequins mm-hmm. rather than models or sort of street casting, mm-hmm. which is something different again as well. Yeah. yeah. Indeed. I think street casting can sometimes be gimmicky, but I think when you find that balance, that's the most important. And I think that having models that provoke a sense of individual identity is so important, like, because you want people to see it and feel like they can be part of it in a sense that like, I don't know, just with the casting in the Givenchy, it felt bland. It didn't feel like, yeah, like everything else aside, like, it just, it's like every model was the same, you know? Especially in a static image, I think you need to bring that storytelling even more to the forefront. And mm-hmm. I think by having that kind of, like you said, like homogenous or very similar kind of body type, it took away in some way where I think, whereas I think that the clothing was so beautiful that it really would have benefited from that additional storytelling through a model that, you know, different types of models and stories that might come to the forefront otherwise in other ways. Yeah, which kind and- of, brings us back again to what we were talking about right at the very beginning. It's like, how does it sell? Is this the time to sell? Is this the time to kind of launch all of that? And how you make people buy into the brand all over again as well. Um, I'm going to do a little outro now. Was there anything else that anybody had to say? Just the last point I had back to the casting. It's funny because it's very ethnically diverse casting. Yet Once again, everyone is so similar. And that shows where it's important that you take qualities in, that are more individually suited to each model. Like you take individual characteristics for everyone, not just all being the same body type or of the same age. Like I really like Balenciaga because Balenciaga uses mm. a lot of older models. And I think with luxury fashion, of course, a lot of the clients are older and that makes a lot of sense. So I think you should sell people maybe themselves versus just a blank slate, you know? Agreed. Absolutely. No, absolutely. I agree completely with that. Well, look, I'm just going to say goodbye to, and uh, thank all of our lovely panellists for today. Thank you, Georgia. Thank you, Shanu. Thank you, Michael. Um, thank you to everybody, and thank you all for watching. Uh, for more extensive Fashion Week coverage, be sure to visit Harrods Fifth Floor and showstudios.com. And if you're watching via Show Studios YouTube, be sure to like, comment, subscribe below. Is that what you do? I think it's what you do. And we'll see you next time. Bye.